This is the essay, Prudence, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. It begins with a poem. Theme no poet gladly sung, fair to old and foul to young. Scorn not thou the love of parts, and the articles of arts. Grandeur of the perfect sphere, thanks the atoms that cohere. What right have I to write on prudence, whereof I have little, and that of the negative sort? My prudence consists in avoiding and going without, not in the inventing of means and methods, not in ardrot steering, not in gentle repairing. I have no skill to make money spend well, no genius in my economy, and whoever sees my garden discovers that I must have some other garden. Yet I love facts and hate lubricity, and people without perception. Then I have the same title to write on prudence, that I have to write on poetry or holiness. We write from aspiration and antagonism, as well as from experience. We paint those qualities which we do not possess. The poet admires the man of energy and tactics, the merchant breeds his son for the church or the bar, and where a man is not vain and egotistic, you shall find what he has not by his praise. Moreover, it would be hardly honest in me not to balance these fine lyric words of love and friendship with words of coarser sound, and, whilst my debt to my senses is real and constant, not to own it in passing. Prudence is the virtue of the senses. It is the science of appearances. It is the outmost action of the inward life. It is God taking thought for oxen. It moves matter after the laws of matter. It is content to seek health of body by complying with physical conditions, and health of mind by the laws of the intellect. The world of the senses is a world of shows. It does not exist for itself, but has a symbolic character, and a true prudence, or law of shows, recognizes the co-presence of other laws, and knows that its own office is subaltern, knows that it is surface and not center where it works. Prudence is false when detached. It is legitimate when it is the natural history of the soul incarnate, when it unfolds the beauty of laws within the narrow scope of the senses. There are all degrees of proficiency in knowledge of the world. It is sufficient to our present purpose to indicate just three. One class live to the unity of the symbol, esteeming health and wealth a final good. Another class live above this mark to the beauty of the symbol, as the poet and artist and the naturalist and the man of science. A third class live above the beauty of the symbol to the beauty of the thing signified. These are wise men. The first class have common sense, the second have taste, and the third spiritual perception. Once in a long time, a man traverses the whole scale and sees and enjoys the symbol solidly, then also has a clear eye for its beauty and lastly, while he pitches his tent on this sacred volcanic isle of nature, does not offer to build houses and barns thereon, reverencing the splendor of the god which he sees bursting through each chink and cranny. The world is filled with the proverbs and acts and winkings of a base prudence, which is a devotion to matter, as if we possessed no other faculties than the palate, the nose, the touch, the eye and ear, a prudence which adores the rule of three, which never subscribes, which never gives, which seldom lends, and asks but one question of any project, will it bake bread? This is a disease like a thickening of the skin until the vital organs are destroyed. But culture, revealing the high origin of the apparent world, and aiming at the perfection of the man as the end, degrades everything else, as health and bodily life, into means, it sees prudence not to be a several faculty, but a name for wisdom and virtue conversing with the body and its wants. Cultivated men always feel and speak so, as if a great fortune, the achievement of a civil or social measure, great personal influence, a graceful and commanding address, had their value as proofs of the energy of their spirit. If a man loses his balance and immerse himself in any trades or pleasures for their own sake, he may be a good wheel or pin, but he is not a cultivated man. 
The spurious prudence, making the senses final, is the god of sots and cowards, and is the subject of all comedy. It is nature's joke, and therefore literature's. The true prudence limits this sensualism by admitting the knowledge of an internal and real world. This recognition once made, the order of the world and the distribution of affairs and times, being studied with the co-perception of their subordinate place, will reward any degree of attention. For our existence, thus apparently attached in nature to the sun and the returning moon and the periods which they mark, so susceptible to climate and to country, so alive to social good and evil, so fond of splendor, and so tender to hunger and cold and debt, reads all its primary lessons out of these books. Prudence does not go behind nature and ask whence it is. It takes the laws of the world, whereby man's being is conditioned, as they are, and keeps these laws, that it may enjoy their proper good. It respects space and time, climate, want, sleep, the law of polarity, growth, and death. There revolve to give bound and period to his being, on all sides, the sun and moon, the great formalists in the sky. Here lies stubborn matter, and will not swerve from its chemical routine. Here is a planted globe, pierced and belted with natural laws and fenced and distributed externally with civil partitions and properties which impose new restraints on the young inhabitant. We eat of the bread which grows in the field, we live by the air which blows around us, and we are poisoned by the air that is too cold or too hot, too dry or too wet. Time, which shows so vacant, indivisible, and divine in its coming, is slit and peddled into trifles and tatters. A door is to be painted, a lock to be repaired. I want wood, or oil, or meal, or salt. The house smokes, or I have a headache. Then the tax, and an affair to be transacted with a man without heart or brains. And the stinging recollection of an injurious or very awkward word. These eat up the hours. Do what we can, summer will have its flies. If we walk in the woods, we must feed mosquitoes. If we go fishing, we must expect a wet coat. Then, climate is a great impediment to idle persons. We often resolve to give up the care of the weather, but still we regard the clouds and the rain. We are instructed by these petty experiences which usurp the hours and the years. The hard soil and four months of snow make the inhabitant of the northern temperate zone wiser and abler than his fellow, who enjoys the fixed smile of the tropics. The islander may ramble all day at will. At night he may sleep on a mat under the moon, and wherever a wild date tree grows, nature has, without even a prayer, spread a table for his morning meal. The northerner is perforce a householder. He must brew, bake, salt, and preserve his food, and pile up wood and coal. But as it happens, that not one stroke can labor lay two, without some new acquaintance with nature. And as nature is inexhaustibly significant, the inhabitants of these climates have always excelled the southerner in force. Such is the value of these matters, that a man who knows other things can never know too much of these. Let him have accurate perceptions, let him, if he have hands, handle, if eyes, measure and discriminate. Let him accept and hive every fact of chemistry, natural history, and economics. The more he has, the less he is willing to spare anyone. Time is always bringing the occasions that disclose their value. Some wisdom comes out of every natural and innocent action. The domestic man, who loves no music so well as his kitchen clock, and the airs which the logs sing to him as they burn on the hearth, has solaces which others never dream of. The application of means to ends ensures victory, and the songs of victory, not less in a farm or a shop than in the tactics of a party or of war. The good husband finds method as efficient in the packing of firewood in a shed, or in the harvesting of fruits in the cellar, as in peninsular campaigns or the files of the Department of State. In the rainy day he builds a workbench, or gets his toolbox set in the corner of the barn chamber 
and stored with nails, gimlet, pincers, screwdriver, and chisel. Herein he takes an old joy of youth and childhood, the cat-like love of garrets, presses and corn chambers, and of the conveniences of long housekeeping. His garden, or his poultry yard, tells him many pleasant anecdotes. One might find argument for optimism in the abundant flow of this saturine element of pleasure in every suburb and extremity of the good world. Let a man keep the law, any law, and his way will be strewn with satisfactions. There is more difference in the quality of our pleasures than in the amount. On the other hand, nature punishes any neglect of prudence. If you think the sense is final, obey their law. If you believe in the soul, do not clutch at sensual sweetness before it is ripe on the slow tree of cause and effect. It is vinegar to the eyes, to deal with men of loose and imperfect perception. Dr. Johnson is reported to have said, If the child says he looked out of his window, when he looked out of that, whip him. Our American character is marked by a more than average delight in accurate perception, which is shown by the currency of the byword, no mistake. But the discomfort of unpunctuality, of confusion of thought about facts, of inattention to the wants of tomorrow, is of no nation. The beautiful laws of time and space, once dislocated by our inaptitude, are holes and dens. If the hive be disturbed by rash and stupid hands, instead of honey it will yield us bees. Our words and actions, to be fair, must be timely. A gay and pleasant sound is the wetting of a scythe in the mornings of June. Yet what is more loathsome and sad than the sound of a whetstone or a mower's rifle, when it is too late in the season to make hay? Scatterbrained and afternoon men spoil much more than their own affair in spoiling the temper of those who deal with them. I have seen a criticism on some paintings, of which I am reminded when I see the shiftless and unhappy men who are not true to their senses. The last Grand Duke of Weimar, a man of superior understanding, said, I have sometimes remarked in the presence of great works of art, and just now especially, in Dresden, how much a certain property contributes to the effect which gives life to the figures and to the life an irresistible truth. This property is the hitting, in all the figures we draw, the right center of gravity. I mean, the placing the figure firm upon their feet, making the hands grasp, the fastening the eyes on the spot where they should look. Even lifeless figures, like vessels and stools, let them be drawn ever so correctly, lose all effect as soon as they lack the resting upon their center of gravity, and have a certain swimming and oscillating appearance. The Raphael in the Dresden Gallery, the only great affecting picture which I have seen, is the quietest and most passionless piece you can imagine, a couple of saints who worship the Virgin and Child. Nevertheless, it awakens a deeper impression than the contortions of ten crucified martyrs. For, besides all the resistless beauty of form, it possesses in the highest degree the property of the perpendicularity of all the figures. This perpendicularity we demand of all the figures in this picture of life. Let them stand on their feet, and not float and swing. Let us know where to find them. Let them discriminate between what they remember and what they dreamed. Call a spade a spade, give us facts, and honor their own senses with trust. But what man shall dare tax another with imprudence? Who is prudent? The men we call greatest are least in this kingdom. There is a certain fatal dislocation in our relation to nature, distorting our modes of living, and making every law our enemy, which seems at last to have aroused all the wit and virtue in the world to ponder the question of reform. We must call the highest prudence to counsel, and ask why health and beauty and genius should now be the exception rather than the rule of human nature. We do not know the properties of plants and animals, and the laws of nature through our sympathy with the same, but this remains the dream of poets. Poetry and prudence should be coincident. Poets should be lawgivers, that is, the boldest lyric inspiration should not chide an insult, but should announce and lead. The civil code 
and the day's work. But now the two things seem irreconcilably parted. We have violated law upon law until we stand amidst ruins. And when by chance we espy a coincidence between reason and the phenomena, we are surprised. Beauty should be the dowry of every man and woman, as invariably as sensation, but it is rare. Health or sound organization should be universal. Genius should be the child of genius, and every child should be inspired. But now it is not to be predicted of any child, and nowhere is it pure. We call partial half lights by courtesy, genius, talent, which converts itself to money, talent which glitters today that it may dine and sleep well tomorrow, and society is officered by men of parts, as they are properly called, and not by divine men. These use their gifts to refine luxury, not to abolish it. Genius is always ascetic, and piety and love. Appetite shows to the finer souls as a disease, and they find beauty in rights and bounds that resist it. We have found out fine names to cover our sensuality withal, but no gifts can raise intemperance. The man of talent affects to call his transgressions of the law of the senses trivial, and to count them nothing considered with his devotion to his art. His art never taught him lewdness, nor the love of wine, nor the wish to reap where he had not sowed. His art is less for every deduction from his holiness, and less for every defect of common sense. On him who scorned the world, as he said, the scorned world wreaks its revenge. He that despises small things will perish by little and little. Goethe's Tasso is very likely to be a pretty fair historical portrait, and that is true tragedy. It does not seem to me so genuine grief when some tyrannous Richard the Third oppresses and slays a score of innocent persons, as when Antonio and Tasso both apparently right, wrong each other. One living after the maxims of this world, and consistent and true to them, the other fired with all divine sentiments, yet grasping also at the pleasures of sense, without submitting to their law. That is a grief we all feel, a knot we cannot untie. Tasso's is no infrequent case in modern biography. A man of genius, of an ardent temperament, Reckless and physical laws, self-indulgent, becomes presently unfortunate, querulous, a discomfortable cousin, a thorn to himself and others. The scholar shames us by his bifold life. Whilst something higher than prudence is active, he is admirable. When common sense is wanted, he is an encumbrance. Yesterday, Caesar was not so great. Today, the felon at the gallows' foot is not more miserable. Yesterday, radiant with the light of an ideal world, in which he lives, the first of men, and now oppressed by wants and sickness, for which he must thank himself. He resembles the pitiful drivelers, whom travelers describe as frequenting the bazaars of Constantinople, who skulk about all day, yellow, emaciated, ragged, sneaking, and at evening, when the bazaars are open, slink to the opium shop, swallow their morsel, and become tranquil and glorified seers. And who has not seen the tragedy of the imprudent genius, struggling for years with a paltry pecuniary difficulties, at last sinking, chilled, exhausted, and fruitless, like a giant slaughtered by pins? Is it not better that a man should accept the first pains and mortifications of this sort, which nature is not slack in sending him, as hints that he must expect no other good than the just fruits of his own labor and self-denial. Health, bread, climate, social position have their importance, and he will give them their due. Let him esteem nature a perpetual counselor, and her perfections the exact measure of our deviations. Let him make the night night, and the day day. Let him control the habit of expense. Let him see that as much wisdom may be expended on a private economy as on an empire, and as much wisdom may be drawn from it. The laws of the world are written out for him on every piece of money in his hand. There is nothing he will not be the better for knowing, 
were it only the wisdom of poor Richard, or the State Street prudence of buying by the acre to sell by the foot, or the thrift of the agriculturalist to stick a tree between whiles, because it will grow whilst he sleeps, or the prudence which consists in husbanding little strokes of the tool, little portions of time, particles of stock, and small gains. The eye of prudence may never shut. Iron, if kept at the ironmongers, will rust. Beer, if not brewed in the right state of the atmosphere, will sour. Timber of ships will rot at sea, or, if laid up high and dry, will strain, warp, and dry rot. Money, if kept by us, yields no rent and is liable to loss. If invested, is liable to depreciation of the particular kind of stock. Strike, says the smith, the iron is white. Keep the rake, says the haymaker, as nigh the scythe as you can, and the cart as nigh as the rake. Our Yankee trade is reputed to be very much on the extreme of this prudence. It takes banknotes, good, bad, clean, and ragged, and saves itself by the speed with which it passes them off. Iron cannot rust, nor beer sour, nor timber rot, nor calicoes go out of fashion, nor money stocks depreciate, in the few swift moments in which the Yankee suffers any one of them to remain in his possession. In skating over thin ice, our safety is in our speed. Let him learn a prudence of a higher strain. Let him learn that everything in nature, even motes and feathers, go by law and not by luck, and that what he sows he reaps. By diligence and self-command, let him put the bread he eats at his own disposal, that he may not stand in bitter and false relations to other men. For the best good of wealth is freedom. Let him practice the minor virtues. How much of human life is lost in waiting? Let him not make his fellow creatures wait. How many words and promises are promises of conversation? Let his words be of fate. When he sees a folded and sealed scrap of paper float around the globe in a pine ship, and come home safe to the eye for which it was written, amidst a swarming population, let him likewise feel the admonition to integrate his being across all these distracting forces, and keep a slender human word among the storms, distances, and accidents that drive us hither and thither, and, by persistency, make the paltry force of one man reappear to redeem its pledge, after months and years, in the most distant climates. We must not try to write the laws of any one virtue, looking at that only. Human nature loves no contradictions, but is symmetrical. The prudence which secures an outward well-being is not to be studied by one set of men, whilst heroism and holiness are studied by another, but they are reconcilable. Prudence concerns the present time, persons, property, and existing forms, but as every fact hath its roots in the soul, and if the soul were changed, would cease to be, or would become some other thing, the proper administration of outward things will always rest on a just apprehension of their cause and origin. That is, the good man will be the wise man, and the single-hearted the politic man. Every violation of truth is not only a sort of suicide in the liar, but as a stab at the health of human society. On the most profitable lie, the course of events presently lays a destructive tax, whilst frankness invites frankness, puts the parties on a convenient footing, and makes their business a friendship. Trust men, and they will be true to you. Treat them greatly, and they will show themselves great, though they will make an exception in your favor to all their rules of trade. So, in regard to disagreeable and formidable things, prudence does not consist in evasion or in flight, but in courage. He who wishes to walk in the most peaceful parts of life, with any serenity, must screw himself up to the resolution. Let him front the object of his worst apprehension, and his stoutness will commonly make his fear groundless. The Latin proverb says that, in battles, the eye is first overcome. Entire self-possession may make a battle very little more dangerous to life than a match at foils or at football. Examples are cited by soldiers, of men who have seen the cannon pointed and the fire given to it, and who have stepped aside from the path of the ball. 
the terrors of the storm are chiefly confined to the parlor and the cabin. The drover, the sailor, buffets it all day, and his health renews itself at a vigorous pulse under the sleet as under the sun of June. In the occurrence of unpleasant things among neighbors, fear comes readily to heart and magnifies the consequence of the other party, but it is a bad counselor. Every man is actually weak and apparently strong. To himself he seems weak, to others formidable. You are afraid of Grimm, but Grimm is also afraid of you. You are solicitous of the good will of the meanest person, and uneasy at his ill will. But the sturdiest offender of your peace and of the neighborhood, if you rip up his claims, is as thin and timid as any, and the peace of society is often kept because, as children say, one is afraid and the other dares not. Far off, men swell, bully, and threaten. Bring them hand to hand, and they are a feeble folk. It is a proverb that courtesy costs nothing, but calculation might come to value love for its profit. Love is fabled to be blind, but kindness is necessary to perception. Love is not a hood, but an eye-water. If you meet a sectary or a hostile partisan, never recognize the dividing lines but meet on what common ground remains. If only that the sun shines and the rain rains for both, the area will widen very fast, and ere you know it, the boundary mountains on which the eye had fastened have melted into the air. If they set out to contend, St. Paul will lie, and St. John will hate. What low, poor, paltry, hypocritical people an argument on religion will make of the pure and chosen souls. They will shuffle and crow, crook and hide, feign to confess here, only that they may brag and conquer there. And not a thought has enriched either party, and not an emotion of bravery, modesty, or hope. So neither should you put yourself in a false position with your contemporaries by indulging a vein of hostility and bitterness. Though your views are in straight antagonism to theirs, assume an identity of sentiment. Assume that you are saying precisely that which all think, and in the flow of wit and love, roll out your paradoxes in solid column, with not the infirmity of a doubt. So at least shall you get an adequate deliverance. The natural motions of the soul are so much better than the voluntary ones, that you will never do yourself justice in dispute. The thought is not then taken hold of by the right handle, does not show itself proportioned, and in its true bearings but bears extorted, hoarse and half-witness. But assume a consent, and it shall presently be granted, since, really, and underneath their external diversities, all men are of one heart and mind. Wisdom will never let us stand with any man or men on an unfriendly footing. We refuse sympathy and intimacy with people, as if we waited for some better sympathy and intimacy to come. But whence and when? Tomorrow will be like today. Life wastes itself while we are preparing to live. Our friends and fellow workers die off from us. Scarcely can we say we see new men, new women approaching us. We are too old to regard fashion, too old to expect patronage of any greater or more powerful. Let us suck the sweetness of those affections and consuetudes that grow near us. These old shoes are easy to the feet. Undoubtedly, we can easily pick faults in our company, can easily whisper names prouder, and that tickle the fancy more. Every man's imagination hath its friends, and life would be dearer with such companions. But, if you cannot have them on good mutual terms, you cannot have them at all. If not the deity, but our ambition, hues and shapes the new relations, their virtue escapes, as strawberries lose their flavor in garden beds. Thus, truth, frankness, courage, love, humility, and all the virtues range themselves on the side of prudence, or the art of securing a present well-being. I do not know if all matter will be found to made of one element, as oxygen or hydrogen at last, but the world of manners and actions is wrought of one stuff, and, begin where we will, we are pretty sure, in a short space, to be mumbling our Ten Commandments.